With Lucas, of course, Nick, you are looking much more at the late stage rounds, IPOs, maybe just very recently gone public companies. And then Rebecca, with you, you're more in the Series A, the Series B. So Rebecca, kick, off, kick us off. Yeah. Is it competitive? You know, it is competitive. But for how we approach the market, we, we really have a lot of runway in front of us because we spend a lot of time on our core investment theses. And now with you know, Gen AI, which who hasn't heard of that? Right? I've never heard of it. Never heard of it. <laughs> um, there are so many really interesting opportunities from founders that have done multiple exits in the past, multiple companies. And so we've done three this year, and the pricing is back down to wait, you know, pre-21 levels, all with the Gen AI focus. But you have to really know what you're looking for, and you have to know what to avoid. Okay, so Nick, if we're looking at Lucas's approach right now, you're, of course, come out of Soros, raising your own fund already yep. in CoreWeave, for example, which is one of the pinups in AI. Was that a hustle to get into? How competitive it, is it? It was. I think it's um, the onus is on investors to do something other than just write a check because capital is something of a commodity for us, and particularly with CoreWeave, Mike, Brennan, and Brian. Um, it came down to our ability to help them tell their story in a way that was going to resonate as they transitioned to public That's market. That's a job, Nick. <laughs> um, but no, it's an exceptional asset. We were humbled to partner with them. Um, but it, it requires investors to hone and clearly articulate their value prop. So we already have brought up Gen AI. So Nick, <laughs> if a company right now is at the upper ends of raising money actually might even be eyeing the public markets. Does generative AI have to be in their story? That's your key yeah. selling point. You can help companies tell a story. Does it have to be a yeah. AI story? It certainly doesn't hurt. Um, I think companies that have AI exposure or credible AI story um, are certainly in a very different um, situation when it comes to IPO demand. Um, if you look at deals this year, two come to mind, both successes, Reddit, and Astera Labs, March IPOs. Astera was a pure play AI narrative, and Reddit was a complementary AI narrative. They're up 60 and 80%. But irrespective of whether or not you have a credible AI story, if you're a CEO, if you're a founder thinking about going public in the next two to three years, I, I think the things that really matter, um, identifying partners uh, that you can see yourself growing with, building a robust finance function, and identifying the KPIs that are going to drive value, not only today, but going forward. There's always going to be public market demand, AI or not, for businesses that have durable growth, strong unit economics, and a line of sight on free cash flow. Does that also ring true in the Series A, Series B space at the moment, Rebecca? How, how much are you looking at the public valuations and having to either down around it, or actually are companies managing to grow into their valuations at that stage? Oh, for our, for our companies? So for us, we're early growth. So we're Series A and B. When the companies have a product we can get our hands on, and then what we're really good at is helping them scale and develop their go-to-market. And that is like a strategic consultant, just like mm -hmm. you said. Companies now, um, really, especially the, the experienced CEOs more than ever, are looking for investors, whether it be my stage or yours, that can really be a partner with them and help them strategically go through the process, right? And so it's very important for us that, you know, I always tell founders they need to know where they would land the plane if they had to, right, <laughs> and, and how that would work. And so we work very early on on, like, what would it mean to be profitable? Um, what but people in our ecosystem do we need to actually partner with very early? And we encourage our founders to go out and do that years before the IPO word even comes into their, into their board deck, you know, to really think outside of their existing company and think very strategically. Rebecca, on that note, how often are those partnerships becoming M&A opportunities rather than actually going public via a IPO? Well, an M&A opportunity almost always comes from a partnership. It almost never comes from a cold start and, and a sale process. And just last year, Case Text was bought by Thomson Reuters, right, for, for $650 million. Big AI uh, play. Big yeah. AI, probably, I would say, the most still the most robust implementation of GPT-4 that exists. And, uh, and they did that because of partnership opportunities, both with all of the AI LLM players. They've been in that space for a decade, right? So they, were, they had the sandbox of GPT-4 in July of 22. And, and that comes from these really strategic outreach, um, outreach motions that they did. 
And then Thomson Reuters knew them well just because of you know, their, their outreach they had done and the partnerships they'd done in the, in the ecosystem. What's interesting is we're seeing some rather novel types of partnerships and novel types of M&A actually going on at the moment, Nick. I mean, you're in Core Weave, as we mentioned, they're trying to acquire an asset at the moment. But more looking at the large language model plays. Yeah. OpenAI having relationships with Microsoft and others, but then you're also seeing... Anthropic being funded by Google and Amazon and having partnerships. Then you get aqua hires like we've mm -hmm. just seen with inflection. I think it's called AI money laundering is one of the, one of the posts that came Ooh. out, right? I love <laughs> that. Sorry. Turn she said it, not me. Yeah. <laughs> there, were some, there were some you know, articles out there about that that were yeah. pretty interesting, actually. What would you say <laughs> of these partnerships and M&A opportunities at, this, at the later stage? Yeah, I think, look, in aggregate, it speaks to how integral... Uh, these smaller private players are uh, to hyperscale AI platforms and to offering end-to-end -end solutions and capabilities to their customers. Um, in, as it relates to Inflection and, and Microsoft, I think it also speaks to the regulatory climate, mm. right? Um, that was positioned and structured as an investment to license uh, their model. Um, you're also seeing a pickup in deal terms, um, you know, regulatory break freeze and the like, um, it's going to be harder for big tech to do big M&A. Uh, because of regulatory? Yeah. Well, and we, we saw that, too, with case facts. I mean, Thomson Reuters came out just months beforehand and said that AI would completely disrupt their entire business. And they, they, they acquired case tax, and case tax, by the way, already had 10,000 of their own users. But they needed that experience and that platform really for their business going forward. And I think we're going to see more and more tech M&A you know, for that reason from these very big players. Interesting. Let's use case text as a case study. Because <laughs> you what wrote the check into that in 2016. Mm -hmm. so this isn't an overnight success. No. But we do feel that generative AI has sprung up out of nothing. And suddenly there's a fight to get into these companies and valuations that just feel so extreme how are you rationalizing what is a good AI opportunity or not? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So we've been in, let's say, a, not Gen AI, but AI, machine learning, since we did Siri, uh, when we were the first investors there. And then we've had a number of uh, outcomes, including Figure 8 and Luminar in AI. And, you know, although it, see, it feels like it came out overnight, right? And really, the algorithm started, like, 2017. And so the companies that were best positioned to take advantage of GPT-4 were companies that were already in the space. I mean, case techs, because they were taking the place of a legal counsel, had to be at really the bleeding edge of LLMs because they were you know, writing text, right? And, uh, and so they had access into all of that. And it was an evolution over time. But I've got to tell you, GPT-4 was just like a light switch. And, and the best comp and Big explanation bang. I have is that the case techs team had tried to pass the California bar with GPT-3.5. And the best they could ever get it to do was roughly 30%, a 30%, you know, score. Pathetic. Pathetic. Although the California State Bar, the average is 68, so also not great. Speaks the exploit. Exactly. So you know. um, but when they put GPT-4 against it, it was 94%, which was better than the lawyers. And that was in a very, very short period of time. So I think we just saw the step change incredibly suddenly. And the company's best position to take advantage of it were companies like a ship. They already had steerage and momentum going into it and they could pick up the technology and plug it into their existing systems and customer base rapidly. Look, it was a light switch. And it, it was also a light switch for many a market valuation. And we talk about NVIDIA day in, day out. It's now more than $3 trillion. I mean, it was at $1 trillion when we started the year. I mean, this is a phenomenal rate of growth. Nick, have you seen equivalents of this? How do you explain this to the LPs coming into your fund as to what the opportunity is for market capitalization growth? Yeah, I think um, if you zoom out and you put this into context, um, from 2012 to 2021, on the back of extraordinarily low rates, you had US VC investment grow eightfold. It was $330 billion in 21. Um, you had more unicorns created in 2021 than you had in the prior five years combined. So there are a number of companies that have been overcapitalized, if you will, um, at a different cost of capital, yesterday's cost of yeah, capital. Yeah, when it was yeah. zero. Um, about half of the unicorns last raised when rates were below 1%. Wow. So uh, those valuations, while stale, can persist as long as cash burn and cash runways permit. Um, 
There's some good data that's come out recently that would suggest that about half of the 740 unicorns in the U.S. Um, will need to raise by December. So I think it's a question of when, not if. And are they, Rebecca, the right ones to be betting if they're running out of cash, <laughs> but they have valuations that, I mean, need to be downgraded? Who, who are you looking at that is eyeing the public market but just can't at the last round that they raised at, I assume? I'm sorry. So, yeah, so companies that are in this situation, right, are, are going to face just really one of two consequences, one, or three, unfortunately. Uh, one, they, they take their medicine, and they take a massive down round, and hopefully the investors are on board with a complete recapitalization, which restructures the entire company. Uh, that's one option. Uh, and that we're seeing 30% of company or fundraising right now in that later stage actually be down rounds and, 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 and largely inside lead. Of the and ones that are disclosed? Of the ones that are, t are disclosed, yes. Other things, other ways they're doing this, I would say it's much bigger than that. People are just doing, you know, a, a, a note document, right, uh, which is not disclosed. Good so point. explain that sort of a bridge fund. Yeah, so it's bridge funding. So they do it, in, instead of doing like an equity financing and disclosing that, they do more of a, a safe note or a bridge of some sort where it's really sort of, you know, debt capital going into it more or less, but, but it will take the form of equity. And then the other option is they, they sell the company to, uh, to a public company. Now, the problem with that is these companies have incredibly high burn rates, typically. Mm -hmm. um, not ours, because we, we try to manage that very well, because <laughs> um, we've seen the show a couple times. But, you know, a, a company is not going to acquire a company for what has, you know, is burning $5 million a month, which some of these still are. And then the, the third option is sort of the least favorable is they, they just close. They go out and kind of quietly quietly go away, right? But a big, not, com a big company can't quietly go away. Uh, no. I mean, we saw Convoy, you know, not that long ago, you know, go to zero overnight. And so I think we'll see more of that. What we might see, though, is actually companies taking their medicine, Nick, and deciding to go public at a slightly different valuation than was the pre previous. And we've actually seen that already. Instacart mm -hmm. swallowed that bitter pill, came mm -hmm. to the market, and... Well, people might question as to how well they've traded since, but yep. I'm interested as to how much you see the opportunity for companies to make that bold step, to decide to go public, to become a publicly traded company with all the scrutiny that goes with it. Yeah, I think there's certainly pros and cons to it. Um, it look, it's a long road. I don't think you know an IPO is uh, the end in itself. It's a milestone on a multi-year journey, and ultimately you know, their success will be proven out in public markets as they execute. Um, there has been a very acute, if not myopic, focus on headline valuations. But um, I think slowly you're, you're starting to see people reorient and valuation expectations recalibrate. How long do you stay in a company once it's gone public? Yeah, it's, it's hard to generalize. But look, we like to think about businesses in terms of years, not quarters. <laughs> and uh, a duration is a competitive advantage for us. It's a competitive advantage for CEOs as they try to build something enduring. Um, How painful is that? Re and I'm, I'm going to bring up a relatively interesting case study of <laughs> yours. You made your name in many ways some really incredible bets you made with Soros and the companies that then went public, one of them being Rivian. Now, today is a very good news day for Rivian. Mm -hmm. Shares are popping about 40% last time I looked because they've done a deal with VW. But it's been pretty painful in the interim. Yeah. How long did you understand that, look, you've got to stay with this company for the long term. RJ is going to get us there, but it's not yeah. an overnight success. Yeah, I think, um, look, you're going to find out what type of investors you have when things are not going well. Um, I think the, the smart CEOs, the right founders, appreciate the value of staying power. Um, there will be missteps, inevitably. Um, there will be execution faults. Um, but I think the onus is on those companies to communicate in a way where they're straightforward and they're clear uh, and they're transparent. Um, that's what being a public company CEO entails, CFO, too. But part, I mean, part of your, your staying power probably is driven by really knowing the company well and the market and having a yeah. really informed thesis about how you're seeing it. And I think that's important for any investor. You know, for, for a CEO to really find an investor that understands that space, that does their own work, that actually goes out and talks to the consumers – um, that, of that product, I think is so important. And so few investors actually do that. But that's really what um, builds conviction for us, either early stage or later stage. Yeah. We can often sell really er you know, earlier, or we have to make the choice. You know, it was Case Text, with Figure Eight, with Gabby, with, you know, with, um, with Future Advisor. You know, we, all, we had 
term sheets to finance it. And the question is, do we finance it and keep going, or do we sell? And is this price the right price? And that's a, that's a question that you can only answer if you do the work, mm -hmm. just like when you're a public market investor. Yes. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, we do see the bad behavior now of, of investors that were sort of, you know, tourist investors that came in and thought it was just, you know, you, you know throw in some money and, and cook, right? And, and it's not. It, it's, it takes a lot of work, and you have to really enjoy the job. Yeah. Talking of, well, startups and actually the going public space, I just got a quick poll for you. We've only got a couple of minutes, but you've got a couple of minutes to have an audience participation moment. <laughs> I want to ask you a question on what you thought about this Texas exchange, which, of course, I think Citadel's behind it, some other key players. Do you think the newly announced Texas Stock Exchange could potentially compete with the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ? I want you to get voting. Use your phones. Use the QR code. I want to know if you think it's, it's not a fun. chance. We could see some market share move southwest. I didn't Companies should welcome the competition. And it's interesting. We've got a few companies, big, privately run companies and publicly run companies moving to Texas. Elon Musk seems behind a lot of them, and I'm sure he might well be a player of taking companies public over there. But, Nick, is it good to have competition in the exchange space as well as competition in actually companies going public? Look, I think innovation, you know, markets, venues, structures, this is all good for markets. It's good for investors. Um, it's healthy for companies. I think what's interesting about the Texas Stock Exchange is twofold. It's, it's one, an attempt to provide public capital to private companies, but it also speaks to some of the onerous uh, burdens of being a public company from a regulatory standpoint on the NYSE or NASDAQ. Great. And sometimes you need that safety net there. Interestingly, I think we have a few New Yorkers in the room. <laughs> but 40%, the majority think there's not a chance the companies are going to move uh, to, to, to Texas to go public. But just but as we wind up this conversation, I want you both to give a piece of advice to those who are looking at doing their due diligence, who are wanting to perhaps either get into the private space or into, indeed, companies that are about to IPO. What due diligence should they be doing? How to ensure that they're not tourists, as you labeled them, Rebecca? I think you have to talk to the customers. You have to really yeah, understand why the customer, whether it's consumer or enterprise, you know, why the customer is using that product and what their go-to-market motion truly is, and if it can scale. Might be easier for a, a Rivian in, or an Instacart consumer than perhaps yeah. some of the more mm -hmm. deep-in-the-weeds AI trades. But, Nick, as you're out there sort of crossing the T's, dotting the I's on, on LPs committing to your fund. What's your piece of advice that you're saying to them to commit capital to you? What would you say for the, for the story you're about to tell? Well, look, I think everything is downstream of competitive advantage. And that's true for investors. It's true for companies. Um, being aware of your circle of competence and, and kind of sticking to that um, is the onus is on investors to do so. Um, if you don't have an edge, you shouldn't be participating.